Well, welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive, in which we take a deeper look at the passage or topic of focus from the weekend message. Uh, this is just a good opportunity for us to explore um, topics, themes, uh, parts of the scripture that, um, yeah, we just didn't have a chance to really go in depth for. And so this week we are in Acts chapter 17, Mark Ryan preached uh, this weekend from Covenants, and just it was really a joy to have him. But on this episode... Um, I am joined by Kyle Bradley, our communications media director, and um, we've we've talked about this passage in different places, different spaces over the last uh, few years. We did a, a Finding Jesus. Is that a class? Yes. We had some podcasts. During COVID, I think. Yeah, we had some Just, video with it too, right? Yeah, six or seven mm-hmm. times, I think. I don't know. That was a weird... That was a weird... <laughs> that was a weird time in all of our lives. Yeah, just because of what was happening... Yeah, out there. But yeah. the class was fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, but I think you and I think we also did a like a few video yeah. resources with that as well, in yeah. addition to the video because the, the class itself was virtual. Yeah, I think they're floating around. Yeah, out somewhere, somewhere. somewhere. Uh, but yeah, in finding Jesus, our our quest was, hey, how can we see where Jesus shows up in spaces and uh, cultural mediums. Yeah. So movies, poetry, uh, stories. Uh, I think we focused mostly on movies. Yeah. Right? yeah. I think we got to music and poetry kind of through that yeah. lens or that that yeah. avenue, but mostly it was film. Yeah. So that's the heartbeat um, for even this episode. And uh, I don't know, we've been talking a little bit about resurrecting, finding Jesus. Uh, yeah, all and, for it. Which would be uh, a blast. So anyway, what we're going to do is just want to give a little bit of an overview for Acts chapter 16. We didn't do an episode um, specifically on uh, Acts 16. would invite you, if you haven't yet, go back and listen or watch the sermon uh, from that weekend. Uh, Mike Shields with the EFCA was here, and he preached, and it was just a great uh, joy and privilege to have him with us. And uh, yeah, so in Acts 16, you have the, the second, you know, Paul's second missionary journey starting. So if you're um, if you've been in church for a while, if you spend time with like a physical paper Bible, a lot of times at this point in Acts, you have different maps that show up of like his different mm-hmm. journeys. I remember when I was a kid, uh, well, if I'm being honest, maybe not just as a kid, but uh, if I got bored in church, I would just take my Bible and go to the back and just look, sure. at, look at the maps. It and, was pictures. Yeah, there was pictures, <laughs> right? It was something there. And uh so I remember being acquainted with, oh, there were these journeys that happened at some point. There was a guy named Paul involved with them, and there were, like, lines that would go from, like, one city to the next. And so that's where we're in right now. Um, Paul, if we remember his story, he was Saul. He met Jesus on the Damascus Road, uh, had this conversion experience, um, this this space, this time with uh, encountering Jesus. It was called the Parousia. Uh, really influenced uh, his theology and his understanding of what even the gospel is and how God reveals himself in in uh, specific ways to different people uh, throughout their lives and um, had a huge impact on his on his life on his journey on his on his uh, his ministry uh, we talked a couple weeks ago about his first missionary journey uh, he was launched from the church in Antioch uh, in Syria the the center of Christianity, the Christian movement, moved from the church in Jerusalem to the church at Antioch. Uh, Paul and Barnabas were, the Holy Spirit uh, spoke to those believers who were gathered uh, for their their worship service and uh, said, hey, I've called these two, I've set them apart uh, for the work that I have for them. As they send them out on the first missionary journey, uh, it was more like a, first missionary journey was definitely more like, uh, well, it was a missionary journey. It was going just city to city, um, preaching the synagogues, then, you know, uh, preaching to the Gentiles, forming a church, and then going to the next. It was, it was quick. Uh, the second missionary journey, the third missionary journey are more, are more like campaigns. They, okay. they sit and they stay for a while. They really develop leaders, um, and elders at those different places and spaces. Um, and so Paul and Barnabas, um, they have a disagreement because another guy that had joined them for at least part of the first missionary journey, Mark, we know Mark because he wrote the Gospel of Mark. He was mm-hmm. a companion of Paul early on. Uh, he just kind of ditched him, like little Irish exit left <laughs> and uh, best kind of exit, <laughs> best kind of exit. <laughs> and so Paul was not really keen on involving Mark again. Yeah. Uh, Barnabas, <laughs> uh, his name means son of encouragement, so he's the. 
He's the he's the Kyle Bradley of uh, oh. the, the early church is what thank you uh, is what that was <laughs> and so he's like no 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 I'm I love Mark I'm gonna work with Mark so Paul and Barnabas in good accord uh, decide that it's better for their work to split um, not because they're so ticked at one another they can't work together mm-hmm. but they're like hey we have some differing views on how we're gonna do this um, we think it's better for the church and we can uh, we can you know. More hands, more work. Yeah, divide like, and conquer. Divide and conquer. Yeah. Thank you. That's what that was the <laughs> phrase I was looking for. Okay. <laughs> um, so they go in their own different directions, and the gospel, um, the work of the gospel expands. And so in Acts uh, sixteen, we have, um, you know, some some really well known um, um, stories. Right. You have Timothy joining Paul and Silas. Uh, you have them going to Macedonia. You have the story of the conversion of, of Lydia. Uh, you have Paul and Silas getting thrown in prison. Uh, you've got the earthquake that happens where everybody else in the prison like leaves, but they stay. And then there's the conversion of the mm-hmm. Philippian uh, jailer. Uh, he, man, Paul ends up loving this Philippian uh, church. And then uh, 17, you have them going to Thessalonica and then Berea. And then ultimately they land in Acts 17, uh, in Athens. And so what I'm going to do is I just want to read, um, I'm going to read the whole section here. So verses 16 through 34, and then the bulk of our time, I really want to spend just unpacking this a little bit more. Mm -hmm. We heard from Mark this weekend. Um, but I want to just kind of maybe unpack maybe more of the application side of things as, as, um, because this, this chapter is, uh, just the story is just really it's had a big impact on me and how I mm-hmm. see the world and interact with cool. um, yeah, creation. All right, so Acts chapter 17, uh, starting in verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said he seems to be a preacher of foreign uh, divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the um, Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Then verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So that's the story of Acts chapter 17, Paul at Mars Hill in in Athens. Um, this is like the first um, account of its kind in the book of Acts. Um, a lot of, obviously, we've, we've already seen as we've been going through this series, The Church the World Needs, we've seen uh, people far from God uh, repent and believe. 
But normally, um, Paul, like as was his custom, he would start in the synagogues. And so a lot of his preaching was very connected to the common story that mm-hmm. the, 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 the Jewish people uh, shared right in common. So he would start with Abraham, or he would talk about Moses and the law and all these kind of common spaces. And, uh, and, then, and then use that as like the front door to get to talking about Jesus. And yet here, he, he definitely goes a different direction. So I guess, Kyle, my first question is like, just in, in even hearing that story again, like what, um, what resonates with you? What, what sticks out to you? Man, two things did as, I, as you're reading it. Um, verse 21, now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Uh, there's something about that that I love uh-huh. that feels like a, a, just a willingness or an openness to receive like a, yeah. a breadth of, of knowledge yeah. or information. There's a curiosity. So, there's a, yeah, there's a curiosity. And like, uh, you know, maybe the time was ripe for mm-hmm. Paul bringing mm-hmm. this news of the unknown God, yeah. which they, they're clearly trying to name on some level, mm-hmm. which well, doesn't feel that different than where can't speak for the whole world, but maybe culturally where some people are yeah. at, trying to just gain a lot of knowledge because maybe they're seeking mm-hmm. for something that they can't name. Yeah, Barna um, just did a, released a series of reports. Mm-hmm. They're describing the moment that we're in as the spiritually open moment. Because, yeah, that's what this feels like to me. Yeah, there's an openness mm-hmm. to, to it. And I think on some sense, you know, whether it's, whether we're aware of it or not, we're all, we're all seeking meaning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're trying to under, understand something of the world around mm-hmm. us. Uh, we're trying to exist in it and live in it. Um, yeah, no, I, I love, I love that. Um, and, yeah, and, and, then, and then down a little bit further, yeah. when he's talking about the poets. I just, I, I write poetry. I think like they're seeking, they're trying mm-hmm. to name, they're probably clearly unintentionally naming, mm-hmm. right? And I think as image bearers, they're proclaiming the glory of God. Yeah. Whether they intend it or not, and I think that's incredible. Yeah, well, that's that idea that um, all truth is God's truth, mm-hmm. right? So we're, we'll say that in other um, world religions, uh, for instance, they're not untrue. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not maybe fully true or absolutely true, or they're missing something, um, but they they're do they are trying to communicate and address and explain uh, true things that are mm-hmm. you know, or things that are true about the world about what it means to be a person what it means to live and you know so some and some religions get closer you know they, there is a creator there yeah. is a um, an order to mm-hmm. things there is a um, a realm or a, a spiritual consciousness that supersedes right my my everyday. Yeah. like space. Um, some are very, uh, interested in, in the body and the physical. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's good. Yeah. It's interesting here. Like Paul is speaking to, you know, a, a Greek audience. Um, and, and at the time the, there was definitely like this dualism happening, like in, in their philosophy where anything that was physical was bad and broken and anything that was spiritual was good. Mm-hmm. And so like that, I think that's why later in this section, he starts talking about the resurrection of the dead and for the for the Greek thinker to be um, uh, like ult, like the ultimate thing was to be released from your body because yeah. that was a broken thing and yeah. so that would have been a radical concept for Paul to be talking about of like resurrection from the dead. Well, well, no, you've been you've you've already you've escaped right. from the mm-hmm. body. Why would you want to mm-hmm. resurrect it? So um, yeah, really cool. Um, you mentioned poetry, mm-hmm. and I do think that this is, um, and even Mark touched on this this weekend, like there's, um, well, I want to go to two places. First off, po- like when you're writing poetry or when you're reading poetry, um, mm-hmm. what what can poetry do that like just maybe for lack of a better way of saying it, plain speech yeah. doesn't do? Yeah, I think – whether I'm reading it or writing it, it's sort of this um, forcing me to slow down mm-hmm. um, and either process my own thoughts, process my own feelings, 
um, trying to take something like grief or hope or joy mm -hmm. and think like, what do I really feel about this? What mm -hmm. do I really think about these things? Mm -hmm. Where do I see them? Um, and so when I read poetry too, it's kind of the same, same experience, not with all, all there's, there's a giant range of poetry. Yeah. Um, but the poets that I like and that I'm drawn to, I think do those things extremely well. They, mm. and for me, I think where I connect with them is like the, the poetry that I love names something extremely accurate about humanity and me being fully human, mm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. of like the world exists with sadness, the world mm -hmm. exists with grief, the world exists with joy and mm. these things. And I think poetry and music and, and, and other art do call us to see, um, yeah, these deep parts of humanity mm. that exist that maybe sometimes we try to avoid or that the world um, yeah. tries to keep us from looking at. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, that's so good. I um, <clears throat> C.S. Lewis talks about like poetry and scientific language. Uh, those are, I think, the categories that mm -hmm. he, he uses. Um, and I had a professor talk, um, I had a professor in, in seminary talk about, we were, we were going through... Um, psalms and proverbs and then some of the prophetic works mm -hmm. which a lot of those are their poetry yeah. and the example he he likes to use is uh, you can you know you can say it's 20 degrees outside and you would be very accurate in what you yeah. said yeah um, or you could you know use words to paint a picture of a a very cold moment right. that causes yeah. you to feel something yeah. that the description of 20 degrees just doesn't right. capture. Yeah. I think even my own, my own, um, my own life, I try to, f I'm always wrestling with this, like trying to find the thing that names something I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And often I think I was trying to do that this morning is I was thinking about this of like, I'm struggling to name it with like a single word mm which is almost laughable because that's not right. Y like you said, 20 degrees, we can all kind of connect with yeah. that. But as soon as you start talking about like what the air feels like and how I breathe it in and those things, like that's a much more yeah. um, beautiful or just um, it's even more focused, even though mm -hmm. the single word or mm -hmm. the couple words might nail it. Yeah. There's an exactantness to it. Yeah. That yeah. When you, when you get to writing 10 lines about the cold or 20 lines yeah. or whatever that is, you, you allow yourself or the reader or yeah. the listener to experience it actually. Yeah. Rather than just like know the info about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think Paul here, as he's preaching and he, you know, is quoting the, the philosophers and the poets of, of the age, um, there's probably a heart connection that um, is is happening for his, for the listeners mm -hmm. of oh yeah I'm I'm well versed in this poem these are the things that makes me feel and yeah. now Paul's providing um, some exactness to mm -hmm. the things that they've felt as image bearers as people who are experiencing something in the world um, yeah. he's bringing clarity to yeah and I think like clearly for some. <clears throat> whatever he shared hit mm -hmm. like it landed yeah. because they go or they, yeah, yeah, they, they, they want, they want right to hear away. more. Yep. And I think like, um, that's my experience is there's, um, when you hear the song or you hear the lyric, I'm, I'm always searching for that thing that's going to name mm -hmm. something of my experience that I can't name without it. Mm -hmm. And I think God gives us those gifts mm -hmm. to help us, um, understand ourselves, help us understand others. Yeah. And I, I, I just like light up when I can find that thing. If yeah. I find a lyric that names what I'm experiencing and helps me understand it and wrestle with it, then that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and they're seeking something because mm -hmm. it starts with, you know, they always want to hear something new and it ends with, Hey, we want to hear more of this. Yeah. Which is such a, a beautiful bookend. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think it, it speaks to what you were, what you were just sharing. Um, for evangelism purposes. And I don't always love the word evangelism because <laughs> it feels so, formal and like programmatic yeah. and um, I felt that when you just said it. So. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but evangelism, right? That's a, the, the process of, of, of sharing what you believe with someone who doesn't believe the same thing um, with the hope that they would respond. Now the, their response is out of our hands. It's well, it's not completely out of our hands. If we're a, 
a turd, <laughs> you know, like yeah, that has something to it does uh, factor. Yeah, in. it factors <laughs> in. Um, Paul is is remarkable here. I think a lot of times this is where I have a, a real allergy to like. Um, I have to be careful here because they have their place, but like the, you know, the, the handing out of tracks, Mm -hmm. right. Um, don't think that's a great evangelism strategy, right. But God has used that to evangelize and lead to conversions and true life change. So I don't want to like totally, because there might be some good intent behind it. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. But maybe it's not the best channel. Right. Um, now I think we can go too far in the direction of, okay, I'm just going to go and watch movies and, you know, just live my life. And as opportunities arise, okay, then maybe I'll step into it. Like, we do, I think, need to have some strategy yeah. um, involved with it. But, yeah, how does this passage, um, Kyle, help? Like, where does it make your mind go when it comes to sharing faith with other people? Yeah, I, I think, the sh- for me, the sharing of faith is um, maybe a lot slower and broader than I thought growing up in the church where it was just like, go tell the good news, tell people about their brokenness and then share the gospel. Like, yes, yes. But maybe people can't hear it that quickly Yeah, or, or don't understand it just in, just in that lens. Although God can clearly do that. Um, so for me, like kind of like Paul, he he clearly understands them. Mm -hmm. So he has a curiosity he has sought to learn something of them. To be able to quote their poets. It's he, incredible. You have to know their poets. Right, right. So then he can find this common ground with them to say, like, I'm not coming in as, like, this um, authority that is way outside of your context yeah. in your culture. I actually understand some mm-hmm. of what you're doing. Um, and And then... I think he seems to me to speak to it with like a gentleness. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I don't, I think um, I, I love conversation around art. I love conversation around poetry and music. I love, and I just think that can be such a wonderful avenue, maybe not to immediately share the gospel, but to find places where your heart and my mm-hmm. heart might overlap mm-hmm. and be, Mm. struggling struggling yeah. with similar things or yeah. delighting in similar things and as we um develop relationship develop yeah. trust with each other yeah there might be moments to speak more of what yeah. Christ is doing mm. in those spaces that's really good yeah, yeah that, that's really good i i do think um so i had a um, pr- uh, professor who when i was in seminary i took a class it was like an elective on uh movies Mm -hmm. and we just we watched some movies and we talked about them and uh and he shared a story of one of his favorite things to do was go to the movie theater and he would go during the day and uh he'd form relationships with like some of the concessions workers or the people that were you know punching the tickets and he'd Mm -hmm. ask them hey you guys work at the movie theater you probably love movies what's a what's a movie that you you know are just loving right now and i think that the the time at the time he told the story uh, the the movie that I guess they were all watching and thought it was hilarious was was knocked up. Now, I've not. I don't think I've seen knocked up. I, for the purpose of this, I don't necessarily recommend watching knocked yeah. up. Um, again, this is a Christian seminary professor who went and then watched knocked up, mm-hmm. so that he could then have a conversation about that movie with. And he's like, there's a lot of, kind of just, crud in that yeah. movie, but. I was able to, or he was able to pull some of the more beautiful elements out of it and then yeah, have conversations some, yeah. around, around that. Yeah. So I think there is something to be said about being familiar with the, the things, not in a way that's going to, you know, we all have our own different filters and, you know, our own stumbling blocks and whatever, but in a way that's going to be winsome for, mm-hmm. for yeah. others. Um, yeah, yeah, I just went and saw Guardians 3 a few weeks ago and... There's so much silliness uh-huh. in that movie, yeah. and it's action, and it's all these things, but there's also so much goodness yeah. in it. Yeah. Um, and it was a wonderful film experience where then, even if it's just me, I can take those things and learn mm-hmm. something for myself, mm-hmm. but then I can, if somebody has seen it and they're excited to talk about it, then we can talk about goodness together. Yeah. It's a beautiful story. Well, I think about you know 20 years ago when Lord of the Rings Return of the King came out, and 
that was a, a movie. I mean, it won like all of the Oscars that yeah, year. Yeah, like 13 or something. Like yeah, that. and everybody was watching it and seeing it. And part of it is the beauty of Tolkien and, and mm-hmm. the brilliance of Tolkien. Um, but there's all these elements in these stories uh, that speak to a greater reality that we experience. And yeah. it's easy to get lost in that world, but like he's saying true things about our world Yeah. in that space. Yeah. And I think as as Christians, right, we have we've been talking throughout this whole series, like we have a message, we have a mission. Well, understanding the the culture that we swim in, understanding and not just that we swim in that but we're part of, um, yeah. is a huge part of our calling when it comes to sharing this good news that mm-hmm. we believe. Cool. Well, Kyle, thank you for this uh, this conversation. It's been yeah. good. Um, like I said, we're gonna maybe start working on some other projects and get to to do more of these types of conversations. Uh, You can find this episode of The Deep Dive and more um, on our website, calvary.church slash resources. Uh, Listen, uh, give a like, um, you know, say something in the comments. I would love to hear from you and interact uh, even offline uh, about what God is doing in your life and what you are um, learning and experiencing. And um, we just all want to be curious about the world that we live in. And that's why we say in the steep dive, let's keep our our Bibles open because Jesus matters most. Uh, We'll catch you again next time. Thanks for listening to The Deep Dive, a Calvary Church Media Productions podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts.